example. These are uh, either documented in the GSOS driver reference or the uh, Brutal Deluxe GSOS internals. So the device dispatcher will call the device after you populate the direct page locations. It'll call the device to read a block, write a block, and such. Uh, there are housekeeping calls related to the volume control record, uh, housekeeping calls related to the file control record. Uh, you can dereference virtual pointers, get the system buffer, and we'll get to those in a minute. So there are two kinds of FST calls, we could say. There are calls based on path names and calls based on reference numbers. So the path-based FST calls, uh, as their input, they take a path name. So what is a path name? There are a few different kinds of path names we potentially have to deal with. There are absolute path names with either slashes or colons, relative path names, which are actually relative to prefix zero, uh, prefix-based path names, and path names where instead of giving it a volume, we can give it a device name. And the one thing GSOS will do for us is convert them to a canonical format. So uh, Protoss 16 are converted to GSOS. Uh, any prefixes are expanded. Slashes are converted to colons. If a device name is given, it will look up the device name and convert that to a device number. And if you have a case insensitive file system based on the <coughs> flags, it will uppercase all the characters. Uh, there's another flag that you want the high bits stripped, so it can do that. It will null terminate at a sentinel zero uh, to your path name. And it calculates the longest path name component, the span. That is, um, some, uh, some file systems have a path name limit. Uh, Prodos will not allow a file name longer than 15 characters. So if you try to open a file with 20 characters long as a name, it can look and reject it instantly instead of uh, going all over the disk looking for a path that cannot possibly exist. So for path name based calls, the FGSOS has an FST call strategy here. So if a volume name is provided, it looks for the volume control record and gives the file system associated with it the first shot at handling it. Otherwise, it enumerates through all the file system translators it knows about, and for each one, it fills out the direct page location and asks, asks the uh, file system translator to handle it. If and then returns that the result. If it's successful, if it's an error, it keeps going to the next one. And then if uh, nobody wants to deal with it, it returns an error. So for a reference number, file system translator calls, these are calls made after the file has been opened for a handful of them as well, calls. So the strategy here, GSOS will look up the file control record from the reference number, take the reference number, convert it to a file control record, then call the associated file system translator for it. And it provides the call number, the parameter block, the device number where the file was last seen. It could change, mind you, if you have one, you have two disks and swap them. Uh, populates the file control record in the volume control record pointer. So the file control record has an ID, which is the uh, reference number, stores the path name, the file system translator ID, the volume control record ID, and then some internal GSOS <coughs> bootkeeping of the file level that the file was opened at, and new line information the access, whether it's read or write data, and uh, file system. And then after that is uh, FSD specific data. And here is an example of the, a file open 
in this case it's finder, it's reference number ref num five on a Prodos FST volume ID is one, level seventy, and then there's a bunch of uh, internal data at the bottom with auxiliary data stores the uh, storage type, the auxiliary type, and the file. So it doesn't have to look them up each time you're working with it. So the volume control record has an ID, it has the name, the name of the volume, a status, which would mean things like offline or disk switched, the number of open files on that volume, volume the file system ID that created it, the device where it was last seen than any FST specific data. And here's an example uh, for the volume hard drive, PCR ID of one, status zero, it's online, it hasn't been switched, four open files on it, on the uh, Brodos FST. And then uh, bitmap head volume header information is stored in the extra information. So memory management, there's a Git system global buffer call which returns four pages four pages of a uh, direct page space available then there's you for allocating memory you can call alloc seg alloc vcr and alloc FS, fcr the uh, vcr and fcr ones are specific for file control records and file control records, but the allocate segment uh, is usable for allocating larger chunks for your own purposes. And these do not return a pointer. They don't return a handle. They return a 32-bit virtual pointer, which then needs to be dereferenced with the uh, deref system call. And that takes a virtual pointer and converts it into a QGS 24-bit pointer. Then when you're done, you can uh, release them. There's a release seg, release VCR, release FCR calls. And if you want, you can use the memory manager. The uh, HFS FST allocate uses the memory manager new handle to allocate uh, direct page space for its uh, 68K emulator. OK, here's some sample code from my post FST. This is the system entry. It basically checks that the system call is not too big. If it is, it's an error. And then calls the jump table. The system startup call um, checks to make sure that the global system buffer is where I expect it to be. It shouldn't ever change, but if there's a future version of GSOS, who knows. And the reason for that is because that address is hard-coded on the GS plus emulator side as well. Then it makes a call to the GS plus emulator uh, to make sure the GS plus emulator supports it. And if there's an error, if there's a problem, if it's not supported, it returns with a carry flag set so that the FST will not be loaded. So the application entry is an example. Again, it checks that the system call is not too big. It checks the parameter count maximum. GSOS checks for minimum parameter count errors. It does not check for maximum parameter count errors, so we need to check that ourselves. Then if there's, there's a table, I'll get to in a moment, that has the maximum P counts and flags for whether path names are expected or file control record and volume control records are expected. And then instead of using the system exit call, I actually push the address on so they can just do a return long. I find that simpler, a little, a little cleaner. And then it uses dispatch table to call the function. So here is the open call, for example, it 
builds a volume control record because every file control record needs a volume control record. Every file has to be on a volume. Then it calls the host GS Plus emulator to actually open the call, open the file, and populate the parameter blocks. If there's an error, it exits. Uh, the host GS Plus emulator returns a cookie, which is the native reference num number, basically file descriptor, which we store into a file control record. So we create a file control record, then update it with the file access, the uh, file system ID, our cookie, and we uh, update the open count on the volume control record. Now to build a volume control record, uh, we have a hard-coded name for our device, which makes it easy. So we find the volume control, we try to find an existing volume control record with our name. And if it doesn't exist, we create a new volume control record. If it does exist, we need to check if it's our, whether our FSD created the volume control record which is okay, or if somebody else created it because they stuck in a disk with the same name. And if they did, if they did stick in a disk with the same name, we check if there are any open files on it. If there are no open files, we kick it out and create our own. If there are open files, then we give a duplicate volume name error. And uh, this is our table I mentioned. So we have a, for each call that we support, GSO's call we support, we have a maximum P count and some bits for whether we use the path name or the file control record, volume control record. Uh, okay, this is some sample code from my Minix file system translator. With the post file system translator, all of the hard work is handled. Um, in C code on the emulator. But in this case, it's handled uh, within 2GS. So what I want to show here is how I handled supporting ProDOS 16 as well as Pro, uh, GSOS calls since the parameter blocks are different. And the general idea of what the they're doing is the same, but the parameter blocks are different. So I use the table-based dispatch where for each field in the parameter block, I store the uh, offset and a function, the field offset and a function to populate that field. And then I go through, I go through that table and update them. I use a macro to actually do it so it's codes fairly clean. Okay, one more thing. So if you want to boot off an FST, when GSOS boots, the bootloader stores a dispatch table at uh, Four minutes? Okay, I'll skip this and I'll just demonstrate about that. Okay, this is the GS Plus emulator. Okay, here is my host FST. I have a bunch of files on it. Let me show you the native version. Here are the same files on my Windows computer. <coughs> so I can uh, create files, I can rename files. I 
delete files. Stuff like that. So all these files here are actually here. I call it MFS because it, when it runs on a Macintosh, it is a Macintosh file system. Um, any questions? Uh, this is the GS Plus emulator. Yes. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Yes. So here on my uh, GitHub page, I have a uh, disk image. There's the source and uh, disk images uh, with the, there's two parts. There's a driver and the uh, file system translator, but they're both included here in the source as well. Uh, nice disk image. There's the driver and the FSD. They both are necessary. Uh, yes. First page, can you pull up the first page of your presentation? Sure. Uh, yeah. Those? Uh, there was a GitHub. Uh, yes, there's a folder here. On my, uh, so, yep, I say uh, here's my short shared host folder, and everything in there is available as that volume. Have you had to worry about the JSOS cache uh, at the FSC layer? Uh, no, I have not worried about that. Um, sorry. Since we're not actually using a device for reading or writing blocks, that cuts out half the problem, I think, and I haven't worried about the other half. Uh, yes? How complicated would it be to create a file system translation for modern back, modern back file system? Uh, on the, so uh, HFS plus or APFS. Um, yeah, APFS is the new one. Uh, I think APFS is probably 64-bit and would yeah. be even harder than HFS, which is a 32-bit. Um, I have not thought too much about the difference between HFS and HFS plus. So, I'm not sure what's the answer. Probably a lot of work. Okay, that's it. And uh, next up we have Neil Forsyth. Yeah.
I'll just turn this and so we can just shoot the video. Shoot the video of that, yeah. Okay, don't don't walk in front of the video. I'll go here. Here's safe from here. Okay. 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 Yeah, actually, don't walk as far as you just walked. Okay, go a little further. Stop. I can now see your arm, so don't go any further okay. than that. Can anybody recognize my arm, Prince? No. Okay, we're okay. <laughs> I'll stop. I'll not go any further than that. There we go. For a second here. Mm -hmm. oh, so you may want to do this. Yeah, you see it. So the goal is to clip it. You see the Yeah, I'm just no, just getting up here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, it's working just beautifully. Okay. That's just the sweetest. Right. Whoa, it's working. That's great. Whoa. Hey, look at that. That's some serious beige there, isn't it? <laughs> Um, okay, um, this is my first time to Kansas Fest, and I've come here. My name's Neil, by the way, that's me. Yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I, I, I don't know what to say at the start or the end, but I, um, I was a bit nervous about coming and addressing today, but I've met a lot of you during the week, and I really want to thank you for making me feel very welcome. I've come all the way from Scotland at the suggestion of my good friend Rob there, Rob McMillan. And uh, I am so glad to be here. I'm, just having, a, I'm having a blast. Having a blast. Not had a blast. I'm still having a blast. I'm really enjoying it. Um, I'm going to drop the microphone in a second because one thing intimidated me the first day I came for, for a session was, of course, the keynote speech by, by, by Roger. Um, he set the bar pretty high. In fact, I mean, it's been pretty high all week, and I thought, God, my presentation couldn't be any good, but I thought, I know, I know what I can do. Uh, Roger was uh, making a big play of going behind the screen, and I thought, I know what I'll do. I will, and I will do my great reveal from in front of the screen. Not on Facebook. Some of you may have seen this logo before. Like maybe yesterday for us. Right. Now I've got to go and clip this back on. Thank you for your, for your encouragement. <laughs> right, here we go. Is that, is that a good place for it? Is that, is that okay? Yep. Yeah, you got me yeah. clear there. I'll finish looking out the right side of your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, well, I run this through with a friend of mine who wasn't pure literate, and it went to about 35 minutes, so I'm going to skim through some of the more lighter parts, but they're easy, they're easy to go through. So, anyway. I'm here to talk today about the BBC Microcomputer, which was a very important computer in the UK. And as I describe it, a computer that inspired a UK generation. Um, in 1980-81, the British Broadcasting Corporation, which I shall now refer to as the BBC, they had long had a remit to do educational output 
for the for the British people. Um, so they identified the need with all the now arriving personal computers that they thought, well, we should have a UBC microcomputer, and they launched what was called the computer BBC Computer Literacy Project. Let me just check a bit here. I'm just going to check something. There we go. Yeah. Um, this was to comprise of three parts. They would have a television series, and there would be a BBC computer. But they didn't know at the time it was going to look like this. And there would be a. They were doing this project in conjunction with the National Extension College, the NEC, not the NEC, but computers. And they were going to create a book called 30 Hour Basic that would teach people how to program in basic. However, also the BBC user guide, which I have a copy of here, would also form part of that project to make it understandable to learn basic. Um, so they put an invite to all the, the British computer companies to submit tender to get the contract to make the BBC computer. Um, a long story, and a really long story short, that was run by a company called Acorn, Acorn Computers. So, right, next slide. So, Acorn Computers. So, Acorn were were um, they were based in, un in in University City of Cambridge in the UK. And they already had a 6502 based computer out already on the market, and that was the Acorn Atom. And like a lot of early micros in the UK, and maybe probably in the States as well, these were available as a kit, but also pre-built, because they were quite expensive. Um, but Acorn's next computer was still at the prototype stage, and this was called the Acorn Proton, or was going to be the Acorn Proton. But they won the contract, and by winning the contract, that became the BBC microcomputer. But there was other contenders that fell by the wayside in, in that competition. One was the New Brain, who were a strong contender at the start, and the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, which I subsequently learned was the Timex Sinclair, was the in the UK. And that was actually launched about three months after, four months after the BBC Micro, because it, I think it was I think it was ready for market, but it wasn't actually launched yet. And it was maybe a prototype stage. Now, in 2009, the BBC broadcast a light hearted TV drama called Microman, which, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it. It's really good. It has a lot of accurate event information in there, but it's also been somewhat tweaked to make it a more entertainment. But this is how it, it covers the rivalry between Acorn and Sinclair for that, and you'll, you'll quite enjoy it. Really, I think you really will. So I encourage you to watch that. Anyway, let's look at the prices of computers around about that time in the UK. So I've just picked six examples of the BBC Micro itself, and you can see our, our venerable Apple II Plus there coming in at £650. And that's the 48k version. The red numbers are what that would be in translated pounds today, which is amazing. BBC Micro came in at 400 which I thought was pretty expensive at the time. Um, actually, my parents thought it was pretty expensive at the time. <laughs> um, I thought it was absurd to buy a Commodore's Vic, Vic 20 with 5K for that price. I mean, that was really good. But Commodore, as you all know, was ready to up their game a bit. But this is 1982, and this is what was available. Uh, my two school friends at the time, uh, they had Atari 800s before me. And there's the Atari. Yo, Atari! <laughs> and uh, it was quite expensive, 590. And there's the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, which was released about June 1982. And it had 48k for 175. It's pretty good, actually. But it has a sponge for a keyboard. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you've ever seen one, yeah. uh, and I put this for reference here, if businesses would like to have been already buying uh, Apple IIs and maybe pets, and I put sharp to get the Japanese a look in with their MZ80As, with their bulletin cassettes. They're quite, they're quite nice. I, I even considered one of those. I honestly thought the brochure was truthful. Um, so let's look at a little bit of the specification of the BBC Micro. Now, there was two models, the Model A and the Model B. And I'm really going to talk about the Model B, to be honest, because the Model A 
and most of the I.O. Uh, not there stripped out and only 16k of RAM. And the reason for that was because they were hoping to make them bulk, bulk sales to schools so they could pick what they really wanted in them. And the one thing they probably would want would be networking. So that's, and that would take care of a lot of the, the difficulties. So this is the bulk model B primarily then. So the 6502, a, a 2 megahertz, which is quite fast at the time, I think, or just getting that way. Um, 32k of, of RAM, 16k operating system, and 16k basic. These were two separate pieces of silicon. In fact, you could actually pull the basic out chuck away if you wanted. Um, graphic resolution, maximum resolution was 640 by 256. Not really that clear on a domestic television. Uh, because they were designed to be used on a domestic television. But the other resolutions were fine. And you had the usual 2, 4, and 16 color modes. The palette was an 8 color palette. I say 8 color palette. It's like one of the palettes are on. And the hardware scrolling. Uh, sound, 4 channels, 3 voice, 1 noise. Pretty versatile. 8 uh, bit printer port. And an RS423, not 232. Zero port. And the reason for, well, not the reason for them, but one of the benefits of that, it did have a longer run length. You could actually run longer cables on a 423. Um, so if you wanted to run a cable from your school to your house, that was possible. Um, sure. uh, two two analog joystick ports uh, and buttons. Um, um, there's, I mentioned there also the 8 bit bi directional user port. That, the analog port and, and the user port, that was a gift. To the hobbyist market. Electronics enthusiasts were all yes. over this, like, like a rush. And the one megahertz bu uh, bus expansion and tune, second processor. Now, my good friend there mentioned, uh, was going to mention, <laughs> uh, I'll mention a wee bit more later on, but he's, uh, the, the tube is for second processors, and that's what he was about to allude to yesterday before I had to. <laughs> and the one megahertz bus expansion was for pretty much anything that wasn't going to be going in the user port. Uh, you had three, three or four, three different outputs for your monitors, quite versatile. And the cassette system, you could uh, have different speeds there. Um, the floppy disk interface was optional even then um, on the BBC Micro Model B. Networking was not standard, again, you want that if you had a school. And yeah, it had a keyboard. Which was Did you have to make any adjustments to it if you were to run it in the US? Yeah. The, this machine didn't make much of an impact in the US, and I think the reason for that is because, as you, say, as you just understand, of course, you've got a resolution of 256 scan lines, and that had to be cut to 200. So the library of software that was available in the UK, you weren't going to get that, because nobody was going to want to have bits missing, and you would basically have to kind of hot start your own software industry for 200 scan lines. Uh, not only that, the price was quite expensive because they had to put in the RF shielding that the FCC required, which we, we just couldn't, we, we didn't need that um, because our, our TV is noisy anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right, that was a problem for the uh, UK. It made no real impact in the, U in the US, I don't think so. Um, let's go on to the next one. In the box, large computer, power cable into the the plan. A UHF cable, as I said, they were designed to be, expected to be connected to the domestic television. Um, and you got uh, a user guide, which I've just shown you here. It's an inch thick. That is some serious piece of work, that, I tell you. Um, and you got a welcome pack, which had 16 programs on it, um, or 15 programs, and a, a, and a cassette form. Again, households in Britain were expected to have cassette players. We did eventually get floppies, but because the price came down, but most households were using their Spectrums and their BBCs and their televisions. It was just like, here's the computer, use what you've got. Go down to the store, buy, buy cassette. Yeah, that's quite a good welcome pack. Uh, a lot of good software on that actually really demonstrated what it could do. So I'll go through these next slides rather quick because this is the, the physical appearance of the machine primarily. And I don't want to spend too much time on that because I've got quite a few nice little technical bits to talk about. Large square machine. Speaker over there, function key strip, plastic strip you lift up, put some paper underneath, put it down, programs would use that. There's a blanking plate for a speech ROM socket over there. More about that later on. Let's have a quick look at the sockets in the back. So there's your three video inputs, the first three in there. 
And then we've got the RS-4320 approach. Now this had a dim plug in what's called a domino combination, a configuration. But five and a dice for a guy. Yeah? You ever seen that? Anybody ever seen that before? Right? The, the peculiarity of a five-pin domino dim plug is that you can turn it through 180 degrees, the, cape, the connector, and put it back in. So there's two ways you could put it in. So can anyone hazard a guess as to why you would have a 180 degree change in plugging this in on a serial port? The one. Yes! You could do null modem! Clever. It would have been if that's the way they boarded it up. <laughs> But they didn't. And I, for a life of me, I thought to myself, even I saw that, and I didn't go to college in Cambridge. <laughs> so that's a rather disappointment. Analog joysticks, DV15, black port for the Ethernet port if you had it, and yeah, we need this power switch. So we've got next. All right, this is the underside of the big slab. All the connectors under there are like IDC connectors with clips on them, little strong stuff, nothing's going to fall out. There's a little bit of a ridge, uh, uh, kind of a gap here with either end for sliding ca ribbon cables under so you can connect to them. The power supply would power your floppy drive, which is just a standard sugar style floppy drive with a track zero connect uh, sensor. Um, oh, that's harsh. Um, so that, yeah, all these ports here, you can see the user port in the middle there. That was another one. Let's get that case off. Right, here's the case off. You can see uh, the blank area for the from socket there, there's a speaker, ribbon cable for the keyboard, the power supply, visited various state connectors across the board to deliver the power. Uh, so there's no Molexes here, nothing sophisticated like that. No, no. We just told our wires on there, man. Uh, that chap. Uh, this is the bit you're probably going to enjoy a lot, getting into a bit more techy stuff. So there's the circuit board by itself, and I'm going to introduce the major players in our, in our BBC drama, First and foremost, our good friend, the 6502, right in the middle there, yeah. in charge of everything. There we go. That particular one looks like it's got a Rockwell logo on it, it's not a Mostek one. Licensing. Licensing. And down here, we have five ROM sockets. Now, as I said earlier on, the operating system, you need that. But the, other, the, the, the four remaining ones, you literally don't need them if you don't want them. You can plug them, you can pull them out. Um, they're, they're for you, but you use the term bank drums, we use the term page drums, but that's what they are. Uh, there's three, well, this one seems to be quite well populated. Oh, there's a rat. Um, these are quite well populated. Uh, you have a disk filing system, you can put other ones in there. I'll talk more about that later on. There's the rat, as I said. What have we got next? Oh, yeah, this is the optional Intel 8271 floppy disk controller and the floppy disk discrete chips there for operating that. Again, that was an option. Later, BBC's had a uh, Western Digital 1770, which is, I think it was even pin compatible. I'm not I'm sure of that. Crap. Certainly, ST had one of these anyway. Um, what next we go? Now, these two boys, the 6522 VIA, a pair of them, two of them. One was for the system for control, they did have two 8 bit IO ports and, a few other, and timers as well. They're versed out, interface adapter, of course. And they have uh, timers and ports. And this, this, the system numbers were used to control the system things, like each line of a purpose, like scan lines or outputs or starting motors and things. And the other VIA, VIA was for the user. That was the printer port and the user port. <coughs> the printer port was buffered, because, so it became by nature uh, output only for the machine. But the user port was bidirectional. You could connect anything you like and decide which port, which pins would be in, which would be out, which is very good. Then we have the 6845 cathode ray tube, tube controller and the video you will This one, just to the right of the 6502, I'm not going to circle that one. That was a, a SA5015 Teletext chip. Maybe you see a Teletext. I don't think you know what Teletext is, but I'll be talking about that later on. But that was the video system. And these two chips here. Uh, that was a, the video you was our obviously uh, custom chip. Right, quick rundown of the, what we can get for our machines. Yay, the fucking drives arrived, they were cheaper, we got into them big time. I never saw physically in my the same room as me a hard disk, but they were available at a whopping 30 megabytes. 
Z, the second processor, 6502 ZAD, and I think it was 3216 mm -hmm. That was a 16 bit. Have you ever heard of that? No, I didn't. It's mentioned in this manual as well. It's a, it's a 16 bit chip with a 32 bit internal architecture. Um, yeah, I forget who makes it. Not from semiconductor, that's it. Uh, over there, all the expansions that didn't need much ports or screens and things, they just looked like half a BBC with no keyboard. Teletext adapter over there, which I'll be talking about later on. Joysticks, mice, controllers, yep, we have loads of those. That big one, right, it's a front, it's a bit stick. And it's like a three axis joystick. So you've got, it's a ball, it's kind of joystick, you know, ball, like, rolling about with, with calibration lines on it. And that's X and Y. But the top is a knob you can rotate in the third dimension. Card packages would use that. You can even you know, measure, you know, go depth and things like that. We have an AMX mouse there. That came in really rather late. It was emulating the Macintosh style. You had a program that would allow you to see file view, menu options, all that, and use that mouse, not even the user for thing. And who's, what a self respecting computer didn't have a logo? Well, we had mice for a little bit like that, but apparently it would. Nice, nice things. Um, you can get EEPROM programmers to plug into the 1 megahertz bus um, and various other uh, things for the 1 megahertz. Let's look at now the screen resolution. Again, BBC model B at 32K, so we have them all. But the ones from 4 down was always available 10K and less. This is for the weak point model A. Um, the resolutions, as you can imagine, exchanging colours for resolution. And there's two strange text only modes, which had less lines, 25 lines. And they looked very similar to, the three looked very similar to one, but it had 25 lines, as I say, and it's just um, And this special teletext mode. Yeah, I'll talk about that later on, we'll be addressing that. Now, if there's anything that I could have changed, there's two, maybe a few things I'd like to change with BBC Micro, but this was it. Although it said that a palette of 16 colours, yeah, it was really eight. And the, the extra eight were just flushing colours. So I thought that was pretty, pretty <laughs> poor. I mean, my, my Atari friends are drawing Brabeer brown and orange, you know, and sky blue. You know, and well, we've got something like that, but not quite the same. So if I had to choose anything, I would change that. That would be the first thing I would change. You combined. Combined. I think there was one game I noticed that shrunk the resolution so that the TV blended the colours together in a sort of punctilism. So you could, <laughs> it really was like, like an art, but labyrinth was the name of the game. But yeah, you couldn't do anything with other, uh, every pixel was just about one of these colours. Really. It's, it's pretty, pretty sad, I thought, but oh, oh. Now, this is an important thing here, it's hard to, oh, you must get this. Uh, the operating system, as I said, was separate from basic. And when you printed characters using commands like move, draw, plot, what you were actually doing was just issuing uh, VDU commands or uh, text control commands. Sorry. You've got five. Five minutes. Oh, man, I'm so far behind. All right. Sorry. All right, well, you can do these. Um, VDU commands were, were for, for a graphics terminal, and they, they, that's what they were. They were just like, you were basically talking to a graphics terminal. So you could record these commands and play them back later so you get graphics speed quite fast. Uh, use define characters. You could redefine the characters. The, the, the repair, the, the, when you redefine the characters, they're not available in mode 7 because it, it was using a teletext chip. So when you redefine a character and then print it to the screen and redefine it again, it did not affect the characters that were on the screen already because it was fully bitmapped. Every character. I want to power through here. Mode 7 teletext. I think this is one of the reasons why the BBC and maybe Akron got the contract because they were willing to put this chip in the machine. In the UK, British Television had a text information broadcast with all, all the, uh, the television pictures in the vertical blank. They printed that, they transmitted data. It looked kind of like this, down here. And uh, only on the BBC Micro, this mode only used one k of memory. But you could use graphics commands to, for codes to make color change and draw graphics. And you could a text adapter would allow you to, to grab those bro broadcasted uh, pages and process them. So if you want to get the racing scores or uh, the news, you can process them like that. And it was good for designing. The BBC CFAC system, they even broadcast programs you could download. The BBC CFAC system ran from 1974 to 2012. Sound? Quickly sound. Yep, we had sound. 
Their the sound command was simple, but their envelope command made it complicated. You could do tons of things with sound. The speech system I mentioned earlier on um, was available, and this the BBC newscaster at the time was Kenneth Kendall, and his voice was used for the for the the, the role. This is the BBC. Yes. Um, it seems like strange to talk about functions to you, but the thing says I mean, you can define your own commands using the star key command. All star commands are actually the operating system command. That's nothing to do with basic. If you do star something, it goes to the, to the operating system chip, and it does the thing. And you can still, you can, we programmers would program all manner of great, easy, quick shortcuts in these things. And you, know, you all know that ba uh, your basics are tokenized. You can actually use the token. If you could print the character on the screen for the token, and copy the character from the screen into your definition, you can cram tons of program into your 256 bytes of character definitions. I had a one key binary to decimal and X button. So I could just say, oh, what's the, what's the X for that? I just press this and go, one zero, one, 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 one. there you go. From programming, it was really good. Um, software, we had loads. Educational software, primarily because what this is about. We had spreadsheets, the games, some were ported to other platforms, most notably Elite. Yeah, yeah. you had that. Perfect yeah. with that joystick. Mm -hmm. Fire, man. Mm -hmm. You know, you know it. But let's look at now. This is something more technical. If you started mucking around with the video hardware, you could start doing some video tricks to get some things. Here's an example. Where oh, I'll show you an example. This is Elite here. I think my mouse over there. Mm -hmm. I'll do this. Yeah, there's Elite. Elite reduced the width of the screen so it was 256 bytes per line. And then that would make the computations easier, as you know. It would change the resolution of the screen down here. I mean, you could get a vertical blank interrupt, but you couldn't get a scan line interrupt. You have to use one of those VIAs to set a timer to wake you up to get your changing. So, OK, better than counting cycles but not as good as display when it list interrupts from, from Rob there. And the Elite did a stupid thing. They read the operating system ROM's definition of the characters. So it worked until the new release of the ROM, and then the characters looked like they garbage. So we have to do another release of that. Uh, back to here, we've got a similar idea with the Elite, uh, with, uh, with, with Revs. Revs, Revs stored, memory, stored the program on the screen. And change the colour of the palette to blue so you couldn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how about that? Save memory. How tight can you be? And this this green here is the is the blue down here, and this resolution is your 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 C20, and this is your 160. So that's pretty class, isn't it? That's a pretty pretty good one, that. Oh, all right, let me back the table here. Um, BBC Basic. The, the important part of BBC Basic. Standard Basic. Understands all the commands. Has all the commands within colours and sound and that, but also it had structured basic. It was procedural. You didn't need to use GoSub and GoTo. You defined procedures and functions with parameters. It had local variables. Computer scientists loved this. Straight out of Cambridge. That's what you'd expect. <laughs> and this is why I bought it. Am I really done now? No, wrap it up. Okay, wrap it up. Let's get straight onto this one here. Inbuilt 6502 assembler in the basic. If there's a peculiarity of this, is that you can't use dollar for hex, because that means a string in the basic. So in this scenario, what you do is you uh, you have to use an ampersand. But this is a small demo here. You have a little program to to add a few registers. Um, I can show you all this all this offline. I want to just skip to the. I'll just skip to your page rounds. These ROMs, they were one, one, one game in a socket. <laughs> Rob wanted to see this. This is how the screen ROM was put a range for the for the screen ROM. The first eight bytes were the first bytes of the card. So you had to go. I mean, what what nonsense is this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. But we had magazines. <laughs> they were all over schools. And some of them used to be. There were tons of them. They were massive. Rooms as big as this, full of people's micros in every school, college, right throughout the land. What happened next? They made new versions, the Miss Master, Master Code Impact. The Acorn Electron was their own branded one from Acorn. It was slightly, uh, not as good. 
And finally, we'll get to the, near the last slide now, where I'm actually just about finished now. What did Nacron do next? In 1987, Acron came out with the Archimedes, and this was a major shift because they created a 32 bit risk processor, and it's called the Acron Risk Machine, which you might know as the ARM chip. And because BBC Micros were all over schools, and the schools is a big market, and if you get them early, yeah, a chap called William Gates came across to the UK and went to see Acorn because he thought, I know where that's going. And then he said, will you run my MS-DOS on your Archimedes? And Acorn said, technically true. We don't need to run DOS. We've got risk costs. That makes DOS look like crap. <laughs> you know, and that, that's technically true. I mean, risk costs is, is class. I mean, it's like a British version of Next. Next door, you know, the next day, right? I mean, it really was brilliant, right? And who knows, if they had decided to run DOS, then logically next would have come Windows, and the whole thing could have been changed. A chap called Evan Upton, in his school days, was so inspired by the BBC Micro, and he lamented that today, people were not doing I.O. and programming robots and doing electronics with their computers anymore. They were sterile. And he decided to create a th thing called the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, there's the Raspberry Pi there. And the Raspberry Pi, when it first came out, was available in two versions. Model A and Model B. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just keep, I'll just close with my last set. I have, I have a question. question. I'll ask any of your questions, but I have a question for you. Can anybody answer me that question? Don't look at your phones. Don't look at the internet. Does anyone have an answer to that one question? I'm just, I was thinking, will they get it or will they not? Have a, have a guess, everybody. See if you have a guess. The cassette, cassette being burning? Kansas City Standard? God, that lady has it. Well done. <laughs> established in 1976, the Kansas City Protocol for Stanford for Cassettes. Because it was a more robust, cassettes were known to have problems. And the cassette system of BBC, you could rewind it and play the game if it, if it had an error. So it was, it was robust. And it was, it was established here in Kansas City in 1976. Well done, you. <laughs> well done, well done. So my last slide, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yay, made it. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Uh, you may be able to smell what's coming next. It's pizza. Um, we need your help reconfiguring this room for the pizza party in 10 minutes. Uh, this room is going to be radically different for really soon. And I hope somebody knows what we're doing. Sorry, I'm sorry to run this.